Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a very, very interesting one on the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. This is lesson number two in that series for April 8 of 2023, entitled, A Moment of Destiny. What do you suppose that would be about? Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we have come together on this day to consider this very important passage of Scripture. Help us to see all the fine points that you want us to learn from these verses as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we continue our study of the three angels' messages, consider this. Jim? From the Bible study guide, God has always spoken to his people, giving them whatever results, oh, well. irrelevant truths they need to hear at the time. From the warning about the flood, Genesis 6, 7, to the com first coming of Jesus, Daniel 9, 24 to 27, to the pre-advent judgment, Daniel 7, verse 9 and 10, Daniel 8, 14, to final events before Christ's return, Revelation 12 to 14. God has spoken to us in these last in these last days of human history, he has sent a special message to the world and to his people. Designed to meet the need of the hour, he pictures his message as being carried by three angels flying in mid-heaven with their urgent end-time message to all the world from the Bible Study Guide for April 1. Okay, let's just talk about that for a moment. When you, when you have angels what what does the word angel mean in Greek? Messenger. 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 So clearly they they are messengers, and why would they be flying in the middle of heaven? It's, it's an urgent message. Rhetorical. Yeah, but but they, they being have a message from God. Yeah, they're being a message from God, and man, they're, it's coming quickly. Okay, Revelation twelve to fourteen is the central core of the chiasm of the Book of Revelation. We talked about that last week. It is where the steps of the great controversy are laid out. And the very center of this, that center is the rebellion in heaven detailed in Revelation 12, 7 to 9. Maybe we should just read that once again. Um, Carrie, can you do that? Yeah. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon who fought back with his angels. But the dragon was defeated and he and his angels were not allowed to stay in heaven any longer. The huge dragon was thrown out, a serpent called the devil or Satan that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and all his angels with him. Okay. Then I heard... Well, you know, we, that's far enough, just, just that part. Okay. In Revelation 13, we see the devil's side spelled out with his threats. And then finally, in Revelation 14, we see God's response. So the great controversy is spelled out very briefly in Revelation 12. Revelation 13, the, the devil gives his side. And Revelation 14, God gives his side. So that's the, the core of the book of Revelation. Any questions about that or comments? And um, in Revelation 14, we see God's response. God points out that we are coming to a critical, absolutely final event in the history of our world. In this lesson, we're going to focus on Revelation 14, 14 to 20, the final harvest in this world. So that's after the three angels' message is going to come what? The final harvest. However, there are things that to be done before that event can take place. And what is that? Matthew 24, 14, Jesus said, And this good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout all the world for a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Okay, you want to compare that with Revelation? Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying high in the air with an eternal message of good news to announce to the peoples of the earth, to every race, 
tribe, language, and nation. Okay, so we want to focus on that particular phrase in there, an eternal message of what kind of news? Good news. Good news. An eternal message of good news. What is the good news that's eternal? The truth about God's character and how he runs his government, okay? God has always told his people that he is coming soon. The earliest record we have of that was in the book of Joel. Look at Joel 1.15. The day of the Lord is near. The day when the Almighty brings destruction. What terror that day will bring. And then chapter 2, verse 1 in Joel again. Blow the trumpet, sound the alarm on Zion, God's sacred hill, tremble Peter, people of Judah. The day of the Lord is coming soon. And when was that? about 700 years before Christ. That is true because his coming is never farther away than our own death. However, as we come to the end of the book of Revelation, we read in Revelation 22. Revelation 22, 7, verse 7 and 11 through 12 and 20. Listen, says Jesus, I am coming soon. Happy are those who obey the prophetic words of this book. Verse 11. Whosoever is evil must go on doing evil, and whosoever is filthy must go on being filthy. Whosoever is good must go on doing good, and whosoever is holy must go on being holy. Verse 12. Listen, says Jesus, I am coming soon. I will bring my rewards with me and give each one according to what he has done. And in verse 20, it says, we, He who gives his testimony to all this says, I indeed am coming soon. So be it. Come, Lord Jesus. So there are several passages there that say he's doing what? He's coming, he's coming soon. And when was that written? 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago. Hmm. Almost, not quite. Yeah, you're right. Um, well, let's see, 20, I was actually, 1650 years, yeah, okay, 140, something like that, okay, however, it will not come down to one gigantic final choice, some people have that idea, well, at the last minute, I'll make my choice, we are making choices either for God's side or for Satan's side each day by the little things we think, say, or do. As we choose day by day, we're inching closer to Satan's side or inching closer to God's side. Can't help it, but uh, quote this uh, scripture, John chapter 17, verse 3, the Lord's Prayer. For this is life eternal now, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou sent. So it's a daily thing, yeah. daily to walk with him. Okay. From Ellen White in Manuscript Releases, volume 13. The traits of character you cherish in life will not be changed by death or by the resurrection. You will come up from the grave with the same disposition you manifested in your home and in society. Uh-oh. <laughs> Jesus does not change the character at his coming. The work of transformation must be done now. Our daily lives are determining our destiny. Defects of character must be repented of and overcome through the grace of Christ, and a symmetrical character must be formed while in this, pro, in this probationary state, that we may be fitted for the mansions above. Again, Manuscript Releases, Volume 13, page 82. I okay. have a question about that. Yes. I have a 100-year-old mother mm -hmm. whose thinking is not quite as clear as it used to be. And I went through this with Gordon's mother. They react to caregivers in such a way that they would never have acted when they were. So okay, so which, which part of your life history do you think God is going to focus on? The well, time when you're losing your memory and you're losing your, your capacity to yeah. think things through? But I, that's interesting that you brought that up. I mean, kids go from the time uh, that very self-centered, right? Yeah. From the birth. And they cycle back to what you described. I saw, I saw that my mother would ne never acted the way she acted 
Oh, at the end. last yeah. year or so of her life, you know, yeah. it, it's just. <laughs> well, I know that, but when you're reading, God does not change the character, or the you go down with the same disposition. I'm kind of going. Yeah. Okay. Not the not, final disposition. Hopefully. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully not. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, God's going to take into account everything that was in your life everything that's recorded in your brain, not just maybe the little bit that's working and still at the very end. As we have studied many times before, the definition of God's end time people is that they will keep the commandments of God and they will speak the truth about God as Jesus did. That's what it says in Revelation 12, 17. So how did these step-by-step -step slow changes take place in our lives? There are three things that the Bible insists that we do to prepare ourselves for what is coming. Bible study, prayer, and witnessing. Are we doing all of those things? Jesus referred to himself more than 80 times in the Gospels as the Son of Man. Mark 14? That's yours, Gordon, I think. I am the Messiah, answered Jesus and you will all see the Son of Man seated at the right of the Almighty and coming with the clouds of heaven. Okay. Try to imagine yourself as a member of the Sanhedrin, either a Sadducee or a Pharisee, at the moment that Jesus made the above statement. I, in fact, you know, if you go back to John uh, 8, where he's actually speaking to them specifically, he said, he said it three times. He said it twice, and they didn't get it. They're still, uh, they're so overwhelmed by their anger at him that they can't figure it out. Finally, he says, oh, by the way, did you know that before Abraham was, I am? I am. Oh, now we got it. Let's pick up a stone and throw at you. We can't tolerate this kind of nonsense. How would you have responded if you had been there? Unfortunately, down to the generations, men and women have been... It depends on what my mindset was at that time. If I was a, had the prejudices of a Pharisee or a Sadducee, I would probably do what they did. Hopefully... Pretty scary, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully we would do something quite different. But uh, what if it was Paul, Saul, who was standing there and speaking yeah. this way, you see? But here was Mr. Bum, Mr. Nobody. Yeah. Son of an adulteress, mm -hmm. being able to say these things in their eyes, you know, that's yeah. what they, I, yeah. oh, how could this be? This is blasphemy. Yeah. <laughs> well, unfortunately, down through the generations, men and women have been taught to, by church leaders to fear God. This causes them to look at Jesus, a human being, as the one who must appease an angry God if they're going to be saved. Okay. You think anything in Revelation 14 might sound like that? Revelation 14, 14. Now we're going to jump over the obvious third angel's message and we're going to look at what comes up next. Then I looked and there was a white cloud and sitting on the cloud was what looked like a human being. Notice this, looked like a human being with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. So, now the question. And this is going to depend on which... Christian persuasion you're in, do you feel more comfortable in the judgment knowing that Jesus is on your side? We need to realize from the reading Zechariah 3, 1 to 5 and Romans 8, 26 to 31, that all three members of the Godhead are on whose side? Oh. Our side, if we're on their side. Romans 8, 26, 31 to 35. In the same way, the Spirit also comes to help us, weak as we are. For we do not know how we ought to pray. The Spirit himself pleads with God for us and groans that words cannot express. So the first member of the Godhead to be on our side is who? Jesus. Well, the first one mentioned here is the Holy Spirit. In view of all this, what can we say? If God is for us, there's a second one, who can be against us? Certainly not God, who did not even keep back his own son, but offer him for us all. He gave us his son. Will he not also freely give us all things? Who will accuse God's chosen people? God himself declares them not guilty. Who then will condemn them? 
not Christ Jesus, who died, or rather who was raised to life and is at the right-hand side of God, pleading with him for us. So now, how many members do we have pleading for us? Three of them. Who then can separate us from the love of Christ? Can trouble do it, or hardship, or persecution, or hunger, or poverty, or danger, or death? That's from the Good News Bible. Should, make, should it make us more comfortable in our relationship with Jesus Christ to know that he was once a human being who lived that incredible life on this earth, and now he has taken an on humanity for the rest of eternity? Or does knowing how loving and kind he always is, always was, as God, make us completely comfortable with him already? Because of his time on this earth, does Jesus love us more and understand us better than the Father does? That's a complete contradiction to our belief in God's omniscience. So who is it that doesn't understand things? It's us. God doesn't have any problem. In verses such as Matthew 6, 20, 16, 27, 24, 27 to 30, and 25, 31 to 32, and Mark 14, 62, the expression Son of Man is used repeatedly and promises us repeatedly that he is about to come back. So why does he call himself the Son of Man? His son of, became the son of himself when he was born. Okay, yeah. Isaiah speaks of him, Son of Man. I think it's in Isaiah. Notice three important elements in these passages. One, Jesus as the calling himself the Son of Man is coming in a cloud of glory which consists of his angels. Two, he will carry out the judgment described as a harvest of wheat and grapes. Revelation 14, 14 through 20. He is also described as separating the sheep from the goats. The destiny of the nations and all humanity will be decided for eternity. So now the expression Son of Man simply means a human being, just as Son of God means a divine being. It was very important for Jesus to describe himself as a human being. On numerous occasions when Jesus used that term referring to himself, he was assuring us that he had actually become human. This wasn't a, he was really born of a human mother, okay? However, there are other individuals in Scripture referred to as Son of Man. Look at Ezekiel 2, 1 through 3. That's, oh. Jim, I think that's yours. And many other similar references in Ezekiel. And this is Ezekiel chapter 2, 1 to 3. He said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak to you. Then the Spirit entered me when he spoke to me and set me on my feet, and I heard him who spoke to me, and he said to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. This is from the New King James Version. Okay, so, and if you go through the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel is repeatedly called the Son of Math many, 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 many times in that book. And Hebrews 2.14, you want to read that? Since the children, as he calls them, are people of the flesh and blood, Jesus himself became like them and shared their human nature. He did this so that through his death he might destroy the devil who has the power over death. Good news. Okay. Bible. Remember that Christ has chosen, he wasn't naturally this way, he chose to, to join the human family forever. He is not omnipresence right now. Jesus himself said in his prayer just before his crucifixion, the passage that Charles mentioned earlier, you want to read that, uh, get, uh, Carrie? Yes. Uh, John 17, 3. Okay, 17, 3. And eternal life means knowing you, the only true God, and knowing Jesus Christ, whom you sent. That's from the Good News Bible. And that really means to become intimate and yeah. incorporate everything you can about God mm -hmm. via Jesus' messages. Become a partaker of the Notice. divine nature. Right. Philippians 2. Our goal every day is to learn the truth about God more clearly and more completely. There are many passages in Scripture describing God's presence as a cloud. 
Often this cloud is specifically described as a cloud of angels. Charles? I'm cannot help it but make the little observation on J John chapter 17 verse 3. Sure. I believe the only one who saw him in his real divine beauty before he went to the cross was a woman and it was Mary Magdalene. Well, yeah. at least she was very close. She was very close, but others, everyone wanted their own. When you come to the, you know, have my son and my uh, other son beside you, but she was stressed steadfast, you know, she, she knew someone special in this man. Well, I mean, look where she came from. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Acts chapter 1, verse 9 through 11. After saying this, he was taken up to, uh, to heaven as they watched him, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They still had their eyes fixed on the sky as he went away when two men dressed in white suddenly stood beside them and said, Galileans, why are you standing there looking up in the sky? This Jesus who, you taken, this Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that he was taken to heaven. You saw him go to go heaven. Him, go to heaven, yes. Jesus, just as Jesus ascended in the cloud of angels, leaving his disciples behind on the Mount of Olives, he will descend in a cloud of angels at his second coming. From the Bible study guide, the judgment reveals before the entire universe that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit have done everything possible to save all humanity. This judgment vindicates not only the saints, but also God's own character against the false charges of Satan. Okay, from our Bible study guide for Tuesday. The great controversy, and I want to emphasize this, the great controversy cannot conclude until everyone, including Satan and all his followers, have admitted that the God had have done, have done everything they possibly could to save everyone. God wins, Satan, loses. Those who persist in their rebellious attitudes cannot be taken to heaven. And here we have some very interesting comments. Gordon? From Ellen White. This is from a number of places, including Great Controversy. Satan sees that his voluntary rebellion has unfitted him for heaven. He has trained his powers to war against God. The purity, peace, and harmony of heaven would be to him supreme torture. Can you imagine that? Uh, mm. Be torture in heaven. His accusations against the mercy and justice of God are now silenced. The reproach which he has endeavored to cast upon Jehovah rests wholly upon himself. And now Satan bows down and confesses the justice of his sentence. Okay, now why would being in heaven be torture? You have to do, conduct your life in a way that you don't have any desire to you, do. So. You, you have to stop telling lies about God. He would have to... <laughs> That's called bearing false witness, is it not? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Huh? Yeah. I mean, he, he, he just, he couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't do it. He, he, okay. You want to read that next one for us? Also from several sources, including Great Controversy, Darkness Before Dawn, Heaven, and so on. Ellen White, could those whose lives have been spent in rebellion against God be suddenly transported to heaven and witness the high, the holy state of perfection that ever exists there? Every soul filled with love, every countenance bearing, beaming with joy, enraptured, enrapturing music in melodious strains, rising in honor of God and the Lamb, and ceaseless streams of light flowing upon the redeemed from the face of him who sitteth upon the throne. Could those whose hearts are filled with hatred of God, of love and holiness, mingle with the heavenly throng and join their songs of praise? Could they endure the glory of God and the Lamb? No, no, years of probation were granted them that they might form characters for heaven. But they have never trained the mind to love purity, 
They have never learned the language of heaven, and now it is too late. A life of rebellion against God has unfitted them for heaven. Its purity, holiness, and peace would be torture to them. The glory of God would be a consuming fire. Wow. They would long to flee from that holy place, and that's what would make it torture for them to be there. Yeah. They would welcome destruction, that they might be hidden from the face of him who died to redeem them. The destiny of the wicked is fixed by their own choice. Their exclusion from heaven is voluntary with themselves and just and merciful on the part of God. So how are we going to describe that? At the final events in this world's history, God doesn't have to say, well, you go over there, you go over here, this one, right, this sheep, goats, whatever. He just draws a line. Continue to be how you are. Yeah, continued Revelation 22, verse 11. The righteous are going to be on their side and the wicked are going to be, and I'm not meaning to put anybody here, but the righteous are going to be on their side and the wicked are going to be on their side. And God just has to say, okay, here's the line. That's up what he was saying is this enter into life. Isn't that mm -hmm. a, a term, a applicable term? Yeah. Uh, go, or go on living. Mm -hmm. The story of Job is found in Job 1 and 2. Describes clearly that God understands us well and made a correct, perfect judgment about Job. Despite all the efforts of Job's so-called friends to undermine his trust in God, they failed. Job was right, and God triumphed. I mean, it it's almost blows my mind to think the fact that God almost put his reputation on the line when he said, Job will be remain faithful. Man. Are we prepared to have God scrutinize our lives with open books before the entire universe? looking at every single detail of our thoughts and actions, our only salvation is to come nearer every day to Jesus Christ. In Revelation 14, 14, Jesus is described as having a sickle in his hand and a crown on his head. This crown is a stephanos, not a diadem. What's the difference? The victor's crowd, crown, not a kingly crown. Okay. A Stephanos is a victor's crown. That's the, that's the wreath that was woven together and put on the head of the guy who won the race. That's the a Stephanos Olympics. at the Olympics. That's a Stephanos. But a kingly crown is a diadem. Jesus has won the great controversy. Satan has lost. So what kind of a crown does he wear? A Stephanos. Not, he's, he'll, he will eventually have a diadem as well, but... The, 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 at the point, the critical point at the end, he's wearing a crown of victory. Jesus once wore a crown of thorns, symbolizing shame and mockery. He once was despised and rejected men. He was reviled, ridiculed, spat upon, beaten, and wept. But now he wears a crown of glory and comes again, but now as King of Kings and Lord of Lords from our Bible study guide. It is very clear from Scripture and from the writings of Ellen White that the final events of this world's history will not come to pass and probation will not be closed until the harvest is what? Fully ripe. What does that mean? Every person who is able to make a choice will make his or her choice for what she or he, by what she or he does. And our Bible study guide, Jim? Think about the fact that your whole life will come under scrutiny before God. What then is your only hope when that happens? See Romans 8, 1 from the Bible study guide for April 4. Romans 8, 1. There is no con condemnation now for those who live in union with Christ Jesus. So what does it mean to live a life in union with Christ Jesus? Gary? The germination of the seed represents the beginning of spiritual life and the development of the plant is a beautiful figure of Christian growth. As in nature, so in grace. There can be no life without growth. The plant must either grow or die. As its growth is silent and imperceptible but continuous, so is the development of the Christian life. At every stage of development, 
Our life may be perfect, yet if God's purpose for us is fulfilled, there will be continual advancement. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. As our opportunities multiply, our experience will enlarge and our knowledge increase. We shall become strong to bear responsibility and our maturity will be in proportion to our privileges. And that's from Christ's Subject Lessons. 65 and 66. Wow, what a statement. Mm. So what kind of plants are we growing in our lives? That's How do the you, question. Go ahead. How do you understand Ellen White's statement that at every stage of development, our life may be perfect? What does that mean, especially when we can see our faults and defective characters now? Okay, God is not searching for completely perfect human beings. If he was or is, he wouldn't find any. He is searching for human beings whose goal in life is to grow to become more and more like Jesus. And so, Myra? It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, Second Peter 3, 12. We're all to profess his name, bearing fruit of his glory, to his glory, to quickly, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel. Quickly the last, last great harvest would be ripened <coughs> and Christ would come to, to gather the precious grain. Christ's Object Lessons. Okay, 16. let us be clear. Probation will close, not at a time arbitrarily decided by God, but at a time when, now God knows what's going to happen, but at a time when every human being who can understandably make a choice for himself or herself has done so. Then the two sides in the great controversy are set. Then Christ will leave his position in heaven and return to the earth to collect his people. Where do we get that idea? Gordon? From Ellen White in Early Writings and similar in Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1. I saw angels hurrying to and fro in heaven. An angel with a writer's inkhorn by his side returned from the earth. Now let me interrupt for a second. Where does the idea about the writer's inkhorn come from? Is that, uh, is that Isaiah or e Ezekiel. Ezekiel? Ezekiel. Ezekiel 9. So it's, this is that from the Bible. So an angel with a writer's inkhorn by his side returned from the earth and reported to Jesus that his work was done and the saints were numbered and sealed. So God's side, the saints are numbered and sealed, okay? Then I saw Jesus, who had been ministering before the ark containing the Ten Commandments, throw down the censer. He raised his hands and with a loud voice said, It is done. And all the angelic host laid off their crowns as Jesus made the solemn de declaration, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Every case had been decided for life or death. While Jesus had been ministering in the sanctuary, the judgment had been going on for the righteous dead and then for the righteous living. Christ had received his kingdom, having made the atonement for his people and blotted out their sins. The subjects of the kingdom were made up. Okay, now, <clears throat> to, to get these things spelled out more clearly, what does the wine press of the wrath of God mean? Well, look at this passage, Revelation 14, 17 to 20. Then I saw another angel come out of the temple in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. <clears throat> We've already talked about verses 14 to 16. Now we're going to talk about 17 to 20. Then another angel who was in charge of the fire came from the altar. He shouted in a loud voice to the angel who had the sharp sickle, Use your sickle, cut the grapes from the vineyard of the earth, because the grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle on the earth, cut the grapes from the vine, and threw them into the winepress of God's furious anger. Oh dear. 
The grapes were squeezed out in the wine press outside the city, and blood came out of the wine press in a flood 300 kilometers long and nearly two meters deep. Tried to, I mean, that's, that just blows my mind to think about that. And what is that that's coming out of there? The blood of the wicked, right? That's what it seems to say. Okay, Revelation 14, 9 through 10. Let's go back up and look at a few verses higher. Jim? The third angel followed the first two, saying in a loud voice, Whoever worships the beast and its image and receives the mark on their forehead or in their hand will themselves drink God's wine, the wine of his fury, which he has, me, he has poured at full strength into the cup of his anger. All who do this will be tormented in fire and sulfur before the holy angels and the Lamb. Revelation 15, 1. Then I saw in the sky another mysterious sight, great and amazing. There were seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last ones, because they are the final expression of God's anger. And what is it? God's anger? It's God letting the, the natural okay. results uh, come to fruition. Here it is here. God's anger or wrath is his turning away and loving disappointment from those who do not want him anyway and persistently insist on him leaving them, thus leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. We can put that together from Bible verses. What does Romans 6 and Revelation 16 say, Carrie? For sin pays the, its wage death, but God's free gift is eternal life and union with Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's from the Good News Bible. Keep going? Yes. Revelation 16, 1. Then I heard a loud voice speaking from the temple to the seven angels, Go and pour out the seven bowls of God's anger on the earth. That's from the Good okay. News Bible. Okay. Thank you. You must, you must, you must understand what the Bible describes as God's wrath. Because if you think it's human anger, you're going to get all kinds of things wrong. All the way, you can, you can read the, about God's wrath all the way back from Leviticus, all the way through Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Numbers and Joshua and Judges and right on through. And it, we must understand that it just means God letting go because people are determined to, to leave him and to go away as fast as they can. And God, because he believes in freedom, will say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to force you. I have to let you go. He doesn't mitigate the natural results of the way things will ultimately happen. Yeah. So and, what are the seven bowls? These are the seven vials is a, or vials or bowls or yeah, uh, they are they're the seven plagues. Each bowl is a different plague, and it's they're they're picturing it as someone who takes things like this and pours it out yeah. and causes. It's a picture. The death of Christ has sometimes been represented as a sacrifice, like an offering on an altar. However, the death of Christ on the cross was not for the purpose of paying some penalty. It was for demonstrating the devastating results of sin, to encourage us to avoid sin and its consequences. It helps us to realize the results of our day-by-day -day actions. And demonstrating is educating. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I wanted to quote uh, Hosea chapter 11. Mm -hmm. How can I give you up, Israel? Mm -hmm. If I'm my soul, I'm God. I'm not yeah. like the others. <laughs> right. <laughs> my soul recoils within me. My wow. heart recoils. I think right, one of the translations. Yeah. 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 Beautiful word. Yeah. Yes. Beautiful word. Revelation chapter. What are we now? Five. No. Uh, Second, Second Corinthians. Corinthians. Second Corinthians five twenty one. Christ was without sin, but for our sake God made him share our sin in order that. In union with him, we might share the righteousness of God. You see, God could separate himself from Jesus and allow Jesus to die because 
Jesus is also divine, and so when he called him, he could come forth. If God separates himself from us, it's all over. It's all over. Mm -hmm. There's no way for us to call to raise ourselves out of the out of the grave. You're gonna. You look like you're prepared to say something important. No. <laughs> there are two harvests being prepared before the world comes to an end. God's harvest of sealed saints is on one side. Satan's harvest of wicked sinners is on the other. There is no in-between ground. The Bible study guide says for Thursday, April 6, the universe will see in the people of God a revelation of righteousness that perhaps no generation before has ever witnessed. In contrast to the righteousness of Christ revealed in his people, the universe will see the full results of rebellion against God. Wickedness, evil, sin, and the lawlessness will be on full display before men and angels. The contrast between good and evil, right and wrong, obedience and disobedience, will be apparent to all the universe, to both humans and angels. Okay, now let's talk about that for just a moment. Satan had claimed back from the very beginning, when, at, the, at the time when he started the rebellion in heaven, that he could run a better universe than God. Okay? So God at the very end says, okay, I'm going to step back just a little bit and let Satan take control of this earth. Just a little bit. But, as in the case of Job, God says, Satan, you can do what you want to this earth, but you can't touch my faithful people. Oh, and Satan is so upset by that because what does he want to do? He wants to get rid of God's faithful people. That's, that's what he wants. And so in his fury, he pours out on God, pour, not pour, I'm sorry, pours out on this earth the seven last plagues. Each one of us must learn how to distinguish between good and evil. Hebrews 5, 14, solid food, on the other hand, is for adults who through practice are able to distinguish between good and evil. From Want the to go ahead Bible. and read that confirmation there? From Ellen White, from, uh, this is from Great Controversy. Great Controversy, there it is. It is a law, both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature, that by beholding we become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. So once again, it's gradually changes, not sudden changes that we make, but it's the, the process the, of education, uh, the growth, the growth, and yeah. education. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It becomes assimilated. That is, the mind becomes assimilated to that which it is accustomed to love and reverence. Man will never rise higher than his standard of purity or goodness or truth. If self is his loftiest ideal, he will never attain. To anything more exalted. Great Controversy 555, paragraph 1. Should we all want to attain the wonderful status of self? Do we have any text? I know there's a place that they, they became as detestable as the things they worship. Yeah, lots but of if we, huh? Yeah, what several would, places. Yeah, if, if, if Paul. If, if, no, that's in the Old Testament. Them, uh, uh, Second, Second Kings 17, about. Um, Verse twelve-ish or something like that. Second Kings seven. That's one of the places that I know I mean, of. That, that's that, that, that is a magnificent statement there. Yeah. Just. But uh, sometimes though, let's take Saul. Mm. Okay, he knew everything, but he just had the wrong concept of a loving heavenly father. Mm -hmm. Boom, one hit, and he takes a look <laughs> at Jesus Christ. It sort of shook up his really basket. Shook, yeah, well, changed the whole thing. But then he had the knowledge, everything. And where did he get that? Was from the Old Testament. Yes. Mistranslated by the by the time he got it came around. Right. It had yeah. been messed up by Ezra. Well, no, <laughs> I don't. I don't. I wouldn't agree with that. <laughs> but, uh, but let me just say that what we do know is that it was very likely that Paul had memorized the entire Old Testament in Hebrew. That's Paul. Imagine that. Just so he didn't, he, that one shock, he gave the real picture of Jesus Christ. That's all. That's the only thing that changed in him. Yeah. yeah. Subtly, imperceptibly, almost unnoticed at first, 
our characters and our personalities change based on the seeds that we are sowing in our minds. Sow good seeds and you will produce good fruit. Sow the evil seeds of this world and you will produce the fruit of this world in your character. If we sow indifference to God and spiritual values and priorities, we reap the fruit of indifference, indifference, apathy, spiritual complacency, and frustration in our spiritual lives. This is why those who think, well, I, I know that one day final pers persecution will come, the mark of the beast and so forth, but when it does, then I will get it together, choose a very dangerous path. They are choosing a very dangerous path. God calls us now at this moment to surrender our lives to him. The longer one delays responding to the Holy Spirit, the harder and harder one's soul becomes to the promptings of God and more susceptible to fall for and believe in the lies of the evil one. A Bible study guide for Friday. Just as water, various nutrients, sunlight and support are necessary for a plant to grow, Bible study, prayer and witnessing are the essentials for the growth of a Christian. Okay, Jim, I think this, we're back to you. The book of Revelation? The book of Revelation is a book of contrasts. Each, excuse me, each of these contrasts call us to make eternal choices. We will worship either the dragon or the lamb. We will receive either the mark of the beast or the seal of God. Either we will fail for the, the fall. Excuse me, fall for the cunning deceptions of the woman in scarlet that is Satan's counterfeit movement, or we will walk with the woman in white, God's true church. Either we will accept the deceptive teachings of spiritual Babylon, or we will rejoice in the truth flows from the New Jerusalem. This week, we will especially study the two harvests in Revelation 14, verses 14 to 20. They are the harvest of golden grain gathered into the garner of God and the harvest of gory grapes tread in the winepress of his wrath. It's interesting that it's golden grain and gory grapes. Yeah. Gee, 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 gee. What will it take for every person living on planet Earth to have a reasonable opportunity to, pre to respond to God's love and grace and to walk in his truth if they choose to do so? Matthew 24, 14 and other verses make it clear that God cannot come again until this gospel is spread to the entire world. Look at a few verses in the Bible that talk about the, the cloud of God's presence. Carrie? Matthew 24. <laughs> Exodus 13. Oh, okay. Exodus 13, 21. During the day, the Lord went in front of them in a pillar of cloud to show them the way. And during the night, he went in front of them in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel night and day. And that's from the Good News Bible. Exodus 24, 15 to 17. Moses went up Mount Sinai and a cloud covered it. The dazzling light of the Lord's presence came down on the mountain. To the Israelites, the light looked like a fire burning on top of the mountain. The cloud covered the mountain for six days, and on the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from the cloud. Good News Bible. Wow. <clears throat> Charles, you want to do the Bible study guide there? When the ancient sanctuary. Uh, sorry. All right. When the ancient sanctuary in the wilderness was dedicated, the presence of God was revealed as a cloud resting at the door of the sanctuary. When the high priest entered the most holy place of the sanctuary, God's presence was also made known by his appearance in the cloud above the mercy seat. Okay, can you think of some other times when God's presence filled the temple here on this earth? Uh, at, Solomon's at the dedication. dedication. Okay, right. there they are. Myra, you want to read those times for us? Yes, Exodus 40, verses 34 to 38. Then the cloud covered the tent, and the dazzling light of the Lord's presence filled it. Because of this, Moses could not go into the tent 
the Israelites moved their camp to another place only when the cloud lifted from the tent. As long as the cloud stayed there, they did not move their camp. During all their wanderings, they could see the cloud of the Lord's presence over the tent during the day and the fire burning above it during the night. That would, you know, <laughs> that'd be pretty amazing. And it does, we'll go ahead. What did the Amorites, Pizzerites, Philistines, yeah. these guys were all around there? What these what people? Yet, and yet these guys are always rebelling, you know. Mm -hmm. We have missed the meat in, in Israel, yeah. you know, in Egypt. We want to go back. Oh. We didn't have space to put in here, but God's glory also filled the temple, Solomon's temple, when it yes. was dedicated. Yes. And people couldn't go in yeah. yes. because God's presence just filled it. it was, I don't know exactly what that meant, but okay, go ahead. Leviticus okay, 16. Levit Leviticus 16, too. He said, Tell your brother Aaron that only at the proper time is he to go behind the curtain into the most holy place, because that is where I will appear in the cloud, mm. above the lid of the covenant box. If he disobeys, he will be killed. So remember that the lid is a very important symbol in the Bible. It separates the glory of God's presence above from the broken law written on the stones in the, the, in the ark down below. So was this, here's a question I would like to hear you think about. Was this cloud that filled the most holy place a sign of God's presence or a covering to prevent God's glory from consuming sinners? Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that's probably the right answer. Yeah. It's probably both. Yeah. Someday God's faithful people, having been persecuted and maybe even tortured, will be able to look up in the sky and say, Isaiah 25, 9 from the New King James Version, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Then you want to try the good news version? From the good news, when it happens, everyone will say, He is our God. We have put our trust in Him, and He has rescued us. He is the Lord. We have put our trust in Him, and now He, and now we are happy and joyful because He has saved us. Good News Bible. If Jesus does not plan to come back, there was no reason for Him to have come the first time. Very important concept. As our world moves closer and closer to the final events, things will happen and are happening that encourage us to make our decisions daily, either for Jesus or for Satan. We've heard about the recent earthquake in Turkey and Syria. Just today, I saw a picture, not too far from the epicenter of that earthquake, a, a gapping hole 130 feet deep, deep and I think maybe 100 feet wide and 900 feet long. The earth just opened up. Mm -hmm. yeah. Corridathan and the Byram. Yeah. Mm. Or the Corvettes and... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, finally the irrevocable final decision will be made. We will cast our lot with the one or the other side. That will mean that the harvest is ripe and ready for reaping. Just as soon, this is from Ellen White, just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it is not any mark, seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. Indeed, it has begun already. The judgments of God are now upon the land to give us warning that we may know what is coming written in 1902 by Ellen White. So are we not ready or indeed is the shaking upon us? The shaking is still upon us. Christ is waiting for people to be so committed to him that they would be willing to die for him. Mm. To die for him is one thing, even more important is living for him. Jim? Revelation chapter 12 verses one and two. Romans. Romans. I'm sorry. I'm going blind, I guess. 
So then, my brothers and sisters, because of God's great mercy to us, I appeal to you, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to his service and pleasing to him. This is true worship that you should offer. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. Then you will be able to know the will of God, what is good and is pleasing to him and is perfect. So up at the beginning of that, offer yourselves as what? Living sacrifices. Okay? And go ahead. When the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle because the harvest has come. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. Now, it's not, you can't tell from that statement whether he's waiting for each one of us to perfectly represent him. That would never happen. But he's waiting for us collectively to represent him, I think. But some of both, I hope. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 3.12. Were all who profess his name bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel, quickly, quickly the last great harvest would be ripened, and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. Notice once again in Matthew 24, 14 says that the gospel would be preached where? All the world. And the whole world as a witness. What does witness mean? A witness is someone who gives a testimony under oath in the court of law. And what's the basis for their testimony? They have seen something with their eyes. Are they able to verify one way or another their statements? Thus, the final proclamation of the gospel will be not just by word, but by demonstration in the lives of God's faithful people. History is unavoidably moving toward that final harvest. Will we be ready? Is there anything in your life that keeps you from being totally committed to Jesus in these last climactic hours of Earth's history? If so, what are those things? Every day we are sowing seeds in the garden of our character what will those seeds produce? Every day we're, we're doing what? Sowing seeds. What is going to be the harvest? Is it going to be golden grape, golden grain, or gory grapes? Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to have these truths so clearly presented before us so that we may learn clearly what is the out, going to be the out, final outcome of everything that we do and say and think. Help us to do and say and think things according to your will is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.